Hey, good afternoon to you. It's 506 here at News Talk 105.9 WMAL, where we're making sense of the news. Coming up, Congressman Troy Nels joins us at the bottom of the hour. We'll chat with him about the House's vote yesterday to impeach Alejandro Mayorkas, the DHS secretary now officially impeached by the United States House of Representatives. It's the first time that's happened in over a century for a cabinet official. And boy, did he deserve it. You can join us at 888-630-9625, 888-630-WMAL. A lot of breaking news here. Certainly your call's coming up as well. I've got uh, just an update here on the um, the shooting in Kansas City. ABC's report is that one is dead. One person is dead. Nine people have been injured, hurt in that shooting. At the tail end of the Chiefs Super Bowl parade in Kansas City, Missouri, they say three victims are in critical condition, five are in serious condition, one with non-life-threatening injuries. The shooting took place west of Kansas City's Union Station near the garage as chief fans were leaving. Two armed people have been detained, according to the Kansas City Police Department. They said that they expected around one million parade goers at the celebration today. One million. That's a lot of people showing up. There's 600 law enforcement officials also in the area. Uh, parade goer Arnold Souther said that when the rally ended, the Chiefs went into Union Station. Fans followed the players to get autographs. Then all of a sudden, they all started running out. You see all these policemen come running in there, and you knew something happened inside of the station, said Souther to a local ABC affiliate. Another witness, Jennifer Wilbur, is telling KMBC, quote, we see people running, and we hear gunshots, and we take off running. We look over, and there's a guy next to us on the ground. Yeah, there's a lot of video footage all across social media, as there often is during events like this. Uh, one, a, a tragic scene of someone who's clearly bleeding out and CPR being administered uh, there. Uh, really awful. Additionally, their, uh, Kansas City Chiefs fans are also seen on different videos actually tackling at least one of the suspects, bringing him to the ground and holding him there until the police arrive. Several men uh, just in, in what appears to be just acts of heroism attacking the uh, gunman taking her to the ground and holding him in place. Um, so uh, we're still learning details there, but that's uh, what happened in Kansas City, Missouri today. Uh, that's that's the update as we have it right now, just breaking news uh, coming in. We've been talking about these climate protesters. Today there was an attack at the National Archives. Uh, they uh, dumped some sort of substance all over themselves and on the United States Constitution, the display for the Constitution, which again is encased in glass. Uh, in a dimly lit room designed to protect the integrity of that document. Uh, But they wanted to obviously make a mockery of that document, attack it uh, today. Uh, We've seen a lot of these on on famous works of art, the Mona Lisa, all over the planet. These these climate lunatics have been doing this. Uh, You know, I'd love to see some sort of meaningful investigation into, you know, all of the money and organization that goes into this. It's just, this is Marxism. This is Totally disruptive, destructive behavior. We saw them do it on America's highways all over the place. And certainly yesterday on the GW Parkway, shutting down traffic for at least half an hour. Thousands of motorists uh, stranded because of all of that. And it's it's a big deal. And we should, you know, obviously crack down on it. We need a society that is orderly and clean. This is, I mean, some of the basic things you would expect out of a country, out of a civilized one. And instead they're... They're introducing disorder and filth and telling us that we can control the weather that way. Crazy. Trish is calling in from Falling Waters, West Virginia right now, line seven. Trish, good afternoon. You're on the Vince Colony Show. Good afternoon. Happy Valentine's Day. Same to you. And happy Ash Wednesday. A blessed Ash Wednesday to to those who observe. Yes, it is. And I do. Hey, um, I just want to let you know, one of the things that nobody thinks about is the fact that there are truckers behind there. They run on federally mandated electronic logs. So not only does it impact the fact of whether or not this trucker can deliver a load on time, it financially impacts his carrier. It financially impacts the receiver. This driver can be refused because of a delinquency. He can be denied detention time because of it. It can literally put a load 10 hours behind because it can force him to go into his break time. And it's not like the old days when you could make it look good and carry on. It, it impacts the rest of their week and the dispatcher's week. 
I mean, this this is the so it's not a small deal. This is a deeply disruptive decision. The repercussions to, with this to the trucking industry affects the carrier, the receiver, the driver, the dispatchers, other drivers. It 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 may literally upends that entire industry at so, that point for that load. And if it increases costs at every step in the chain there, uh, who do those costs get passed off to? Um, eventually you. Yes, the consumer. So the people who are blocking traffic because they say they want to you know, save the planet are actually uh, adding burden to the people who can least afford it. Well, they're still impacting you. That's for sure. Yeah. Trish, Trish, are you in the are, are you in the trucking business? Have you been? I was for decades. Yeah. And so and so you but you recognize that, that this would have an immense damage on on the livelihood of the people who actually deliver our goods. Immense is an understatement. Man. Well, it's happening and it keeps happening. Trish, thank you. I appreciate that call from Falling Waters, West Virginia. Trish's perspective there. Uh, Donna in Frederick calling in, as she so often does. Line six. Donna, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Vince. You know, I was thinking if enough people are frustrated, uh, maybe the environmental group deserves a nice fat class action lawsuit against their organization. And, um, you know, I don't know how people can do that, but I guess it starts with one and can move on. But if it were me, I would have been up. Up one side of those people and down the other, just I, like our hero was. She was extraordinary, and that's what it's going to take more of. People have to stand up. Enough is enough. And I, I totally have, agree, Donna. I don't know person. about you, but my I was I was kind yeah. of thinking I was kind of playing it out in my head. I was like, man, I kind of wish I was there. I wish I. I mean, like, I don't want to be mm-hmm. late for anything. I want to. I want to get to work on time. I want to be able to do the, do the show. Uh, you know, it's always it's miserable if you get stuck in, lo- in, in like log jam traffic and you're like, am I going to make it even and sometimes you're looking you're like even within an hour or two, am I going to make it? And so the, I was thinking, man, I would have loved to be you're talking about Ugria, who we spoke with earlier. She was the woman who was yeah, right was in the amazing. front of the line as they blocked mm-hmm. off traffic. I was thinking, man, I wish I was there. I wish I, if, if not the front, like car number two, I would get out. I have my camera. I'd interview these people. I would straight up just read them the riot act, do it on camera, do the interview. We'd have the content for the show. We'd expose how stupid this whole thing is. Yeah. And the more people that stand with somebody like that, the more powerful we become. And that's what we need to do. We can't just sit by idly yeah. and tolerate this. We're beyond the tolerance point, Vince. And like I was saying, I have an elderly person in my family. If I had to get to them and somebody blocked me, oh, my goodness. You talk about raging witch, I'd be beyond. Like <laughs> they, can't, they cannot do that. I have a feeling, I have a feeling you that. censored your truth thoughts on that one. Thank you, Donna. I appreciate Absolutely. it. I appreciate the oh, call as always. Uh, also, uh, a guy we hear from every so often, Phil from Fredericksburg, is on line four. Phil, good afternoon. You're on the Vince Colony Show. Look, I just want to tell anybody who wants to do this to please do not do this. You are going to get run over. This is America. This is not England. This is not Sweden. This is not Australia, where the police are going to protect you, where it's organized so that people who come up get arrested by the police. You are going to get hurt. Yeah, somebody's going to do that. It belongs to the working people. It belongs to the cars. The cars rule the world in America, baby. Yeah, yeah. Don't no, you're you're right. It's a, it's an it. important point. I mean, at some point, somebody is not going to deal with this, and they're just going to go through. And of course, you know what will happen is the media is going to go wild. In fact, they're going to the, the bad guy will become the car, the guy who drove the car, uh, and then they will use it to to further rob Americans of liberty. It'll be all, a whole disaster. But but the truth is, just in terms of of an individual's well being, the last thing you want to do is get in front of a car in traffic. What do you tell your kids from their earliest time when they start walking? The last thing you do is uh, play around next to a road. What what happens if the guy's driving a Tesla that runs him over? Yeah, well then then we got a whole another series of problems we're going to have to untangle, Phil. Uh, thank you. It's it's a good a good hypothetical. It could happen. Uh, the, the government keeps mandating everybody get into one of those. It's amazing. Um. Okay. Let's. Uh. I, I also need to get back to some of the uh, things that are going on on Capitol Hill that don't involve disrupting traffic. Um. Big to do today about the House Intel Committee. Um. You get the House Intel Committee comes out. The chairman of that committee, Mike Turner, 
announces an all-hands briefing. Everybody in Congress needs to be briefed on an urgent national security threat. The White House jumps out and says, actually, we're the ones who prompted the beginning of this. And we're a little annoyed that Mike Turner's telling everybody about this urgent national security threat. And it all comes at a deeply convenient time in Congress because Congress right now is is considering renewing FISA warrantless surveillance on American citizens. And they want to conjure up that, oh, we've got this big threat we have to deal with. So, of course, we need all these powers to be renewed immediately without any meaningful consideration. Right now, the update today is that Speaker Johnson has said, no, we're not having the FISA vote this week. He decided to cancel it. It's not happening this week. That's great news. Maybe perhaps he's he's aware of, of what kind of shenanigans are afoot here. But we just got an update on this story. We were wondering, what's the urgent briefing about? And the answer to that appears to be, by way of the New York Times, that remember, we, we said there was some rumors that it involved Russia. It's Russia again. The big threat. Uh, New York Times headline, U.S. has new intelligence about Russia's nuclear capabilities. Now, let me just make an obvious point really quickly. The idea that Russia is a nuclear threat is not in any way classified or a new piece of information to any of us. Russia has more nuclear warheads than any other country on the planet. This is not a new thing at all. The United, but, but here's what they dig into. This is what they say. The United States has informed Congress and its allies in Europe of new intelligence about Russian nuclear capabilities that could pose an international threat, according to officials briefed on the matter. Officials said that the new intelligence was serious, but that the capability was still under development, and Russia has not deployed it. Oh, so it's not urgent. This is Russia is contemplating, R&Ding, looking into a new nuclear threat. <laughs> Come on. What is, this is a scam. This is a scam. It didn't require an all-hands briefing. This is meant to whip up a public panic. They continue. Consequently, it did not pose an urgent threat to the United States, Ukraine, or America's European allies, they said. The information is highly classified. An official said it could not be declassified without cutting off its source. Really? So then why'd they leak it to the New York Times? Oh, we don't want people to know that we know this. Otherwise, our source will dry up. Well, then why did you leak it? To the New York Times. A current and former U.S. official said the new intelligence was related to Russia's attempts to develop a space-based anti-satellite nuclear weapon. That sounds fun. Firing nukes in space. ABC News reported earlier that the intelligence had to do with such a capability. Current and former officials said the nuclear weapon was not in orbit. All right, so this, it, so now this demonstrates that this whole thing was a lie. It was not an urgent threat. There was not a pressing 24 hours notice situation. The alien invasion is not one light year away moving at half a light year each day. I mean, like, it's like the whole thing is crazy. It is a predicate to advance some other goal, whether it's to renew warrantless surveillance of American citizens or to fire off 60 billion new dollars to Ukraine. There's a lot of things going on here. In fact, Bob's in North Carolina. Line two, Bob has a theory about this. Bob, good afternoon. You're on the Vince Colonnais Show. Hey, Vince. This is Bob here in the wonderful mountains of North Carolina. Here's what's going on. Yesterday, with the revelation by Taibbi and uh, his uh, Schellenberger Schellenberger. about this this magic book that uh, allegedly Trump has that has all the information, where CIA Director Brennan Mm -hmm. got these five eyes to spy on 26 of Trump's closest folks. This is a huge revelation story that's going to further uh, unseat the uh, Democrats on what they've been doing. Uh, in and, our, and, in and who, Bob, in Bob, from that reporting, what House committee was the source of this information? Well, by co- total coincidence, obviously, <laughs> uh, Republican Republican Mike Turner's staff is part of the source of this information. Yes, that's right. And so now, the, so now the White House today is coming down all over him. You smell a rat. There's something very. You're right to you're right to suspect things. Here's the other piece, though, that Mike Turner, if he's going to call an all hands meeting to the extent that he should on any issue, it should be on this. 
on the fact that the intelligence community solicited the support of the global IC, the intelligence community, the five eyes, to spy on the Trump campaign, they should be holding an all-hands briefing on that intelligence. That is the story that should be told right now to every single member of Congress. And Bob, it is not being told. And instead, we're being served up this stupidity today that Russia is contemplating developing technology that it hasn't actually developed and implemented. It's so it's nothing more, not nothing more than another distraction uh, against the stories from the White House and from the Democrats. It's yeah. all this is. Everybody, it's a distraction. Disregard. In fact, Lieutenant General Kellogg was on Fox about, I don't know, an hour and a half ago. And when he was hearing from his, I'm confident, sure, yep. very reliable sources, this part that um, that was reported that uh, it's nothing really big and bad out I know. there. I know. Uh, you and, and, should not get excited about this. Yep. Et cetera. You're right about it, Bob. Thank you for the call. I appreciate it. we got to run. But you're right. Congressman Bob Good just told us an hour ago. He said I, members of Congress have been speaking to him. He doesn't know what the intel is yet because he hasn't been in for the briefing. But he says nobody's telling him he has to get there quickly. <laughs> it's not that big of a deal. Alejandro Mayorkas impeached by the United States House of Representatives last night. They have finally got that through. Congressman Troy Nels will be joining us just moments from now to discuss what comes next for the embattled DHS secretary. Hey, good afternoon to you. It's 535 here at News Talk 105.9 WMAL, where we are making sense of the news. You can join us today. It's 888-630-9625, 888-630-WMAL. Well, it's a good thing Republicans got that vote through last night to impeach Alejandro Mayorkas, the balance of power. They barely have a majority in the House right now. And then, of course, that Nassau County special election took place last night in Long Island. Didn't go Republicans' way. It's not like they really had the votes to spare. Looking really stupid to kick out George Santos, isn't it? Really stupid. But anyway, 214 to 213. Republicans successfully impeached Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas, sending the issue over to the Senate now. That's how impeachments work, as we've all come to know very well. Here to talk about that decision last night, that vote, Congressman Troy Nels joins us. Sir, good to have you back with us. Thank you. Vince, good to be with you, brother. Well, you must, be, re you. You must be relieved to, to finally get the impeachment vote through for Alejandro Mayorkas. Yeah, we tried to get it done last week. Didn't work out. Obviously, Steve Scalise was out, so we missed that opportunity there. But it was good to have Steve back. You know, you reflect at some of our actions over the last couple months, and I'm thinking, well, if we'd had George, you know, Santos here last week, it'd have been done last week, and we wouldn't have had to go through this again. But here nor there, it was the right thing to do. I think it's holding, you know, the Biden administration, i.e., cabinet secretaries, all of them accountable. Uh, for their performance or lack thereof. So it was the right thing to do, and I'm, I'm glad I supported it. Three Republicans voted against it. They voted to save Mayorkas from this fate. Uh, Mike Gallagher, Ken Buck, and Tom McClintock, they've given uh, varying reasons over these past few weeks as to why, including that they thought that it would be a horrible precedent that Republicans were setting. What do you think of this idea that this is precedential and that it's a, a bad use of your time? Well, it's not a bad use of our time, and two of the three names you just mentioned aren't coming back. They're not coming back. So here nor there, uh, I guess we just have a difference of opinion, but but I do know that the Democrats, uh, they're ruthless in what they do. Uh, they've impeached the greatest president in our lifetime twice and didn't care one thing whether they had any evidence or not, and now you find out that all of the the impeachment one and two is all nothing but a bunch of horsemen. So, no, I, I, I've said to my friends, I said the Republican Party has to learn how to get into the slop with the pegs. We got to get into the slop with the pegs because the Democrats are ruthless. We need her to learn. We need to learn how to win elections. And that means you have to get down and dirty, unfortunately, because the Democrats do. So, well, uh, I, yeah, but it doesn't mean doing something unethical. I mean, as you point out, I, I think that you know Mayorkas merited this impeachment. He has completely abandoned his obligations to actually secure the homeland. 
Uh, and that in particular includes the United States border, which is now wide open under his leadership. In addition to getting on the cameras and continuing to lie to the American people, obstructing Congress, not wanting to come in and produce documents. So, no, I listen, I have no sympathy on this guy. He knew what he was doing. He's working for his boss. We know his boss, what, what his boss wants him to do. So he fell on his sword for his boss, I guess, is what he's going to do here. But the point is, is that my orcas would get out in front of those cameras and tell the American people that we have a secure southern border. Come on, man. Everybody could see the southern border, the thousands that are coming through. Matter of fact, why don't you go ask the mayor, Eric Adams, up in New York, whether we have a secure southern border, whether we have an immigration issue in this country. Does it? He's going to say, man, we got him coming up here, and now we're complaining about it. We want to move him everywhere else. So Mayorkas has been an absolute failure. He was derelict in his duty to help keep this homeland safe, and it was an honor and a privilege and a great day for America yesterday to vote for impeachment. Oh, so where does it go from here? Obviously, this impeachment gets sent over to the Senate for a trial, a consideration of whether or not to convict. Uh, what we, we presume that Democrats, as you point out, aren't going to uh, convict him. They're going to they're going to move to acquit him in, as, as expeditiously as possible. What do you expect on the Senate side? Well, so what you have now, you'll have these managers. There's going to be 11 of them. They're called managers. They're kind of like uh, they're prosecutors. So you'll have 11 House members walk these articles of impeachment over there uh, where they'll have like a trial. Now, Chuck Schumer, who presides over the Senate, I'm assuming what he will do is he will say there is no credibility in this case. He's not going to he's going to try to shut this down, in my opinion, as quickly as possible. He's not going to even want to see a trial. He's not going to want to give this impeachment any credibility. So in my humble opinion, is when the, when we walk these articles over there, uh, I think he'll immediately, Chuck Schumer will do immediate, he'll say, I do a motion to uh, dismiss, and he gets the majority on that, and they'll dismiss. But it's going to be some games back and forth on how they're going to do this, but Chuck Schumer doesn't want to give this impeachment any credibility. No way. Are there going to be TV cameras following the the uh, transmission of the articles of impeachment over to the Senate? I remember when uh, they did this to Donald Trump. These were big televised affairs. They were literally walking documents down a hallway. Well, sure, because when you when you come to the Capitol building, you got the House on one side and you got the Senate on the other side, and there's a long hallway that separates them. You'll be walking through the rotunda. Yeah, you walk through statutory hall, and the media has access to all those areas. So you you bet you can assume that there will be an enormous amount of media watching these eleven members walk these articles of impeachment over to the Senate and present them to the Senate. Absolutely, there's it's going to be a it will be all over the the, the television without a doubt. But it's not going to be for a couple of weeks. It won't be for a couple of weeks because the Senate is out now. So you wait until the Senate gets back into session before you begin that process. Yeah, yeah they're not. Chuck's not going to call that. Yeah, it'll be a couple of weeks before this. this OK, happens. let me I want to I want to play some of the White House reaction to this. The White House was as eloquent as every yesterday uh, in responding uh, today, actually, in responding to all of this. Here is Corrine Jean-Pierre. Tree will not rem- will not uh, look kindly on House Republicans for this blatant act of uh, what we believe to be unconstitutional unconstitutional bipartisanship, what? and so we believe that uh, what occurred last night is by is um, is baseless. It's shameful. Uh, we have to remember this is a. Uh, this is a, a secretary who worked really hard with the Senate to try to get that bipartisan agreement with obviously with Republicans and Democrats when it as it as it relates to the uh, border security. And we believe if that had been put into place, if we had if it had been moved forward, it would have been the, the tough. Yes, the toughest, but also the fairest uh, piece uh, piece of legislation obviously would have been into law uh, that would have dealt with a broken immigration system, beginning to deal with that. And obviously the challenges that we see uh, at the border. Congressman Troy Nels, I don't know if you caught that, but I think you're guilty of what she refers to as unconstitutional bipartisanship, yeah. sir. Shame on you. Yeah. How baseless and shameful, she feels. These, you know, what you did, and I can't even stand listening to her. I can't stand her. She's nothing but a mouthpiece, and she's not very good at it, but we know why she's there. The point is, is that baseless and shameful, right? Well, listen, what did you do to Donald J. Trump? Russia, Russia, Russia. Yeah. You actually lied. They got people to lie and make up these allegations, right? 
and these claims that Donald collusion with Russia, 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 and then we find out they're totally false. And then they want to go in and take Donald Trump on January 6th. So the Democrats are ruthless. And that's why I'm telling you, like, when I tell you that, when I said that you got to get into the flop with the pigs, is because they are ruthless. But they're good at winning elections as well. And so we have to understand that as a party is that the Democrats don't care. We, we, what did we do? We expelled George Santos for indictments, allegations, and maybe he gets convicted. Maybe he doesn't. I don't know. But yet Chuck Schumer has got Menendez over there yeah. with gold bars and cash in his pocket. But Chuck Schumer's not as stupid as we are. Chuck Schumer knows, listen, we got a guy over here who's got some ethical issues, but i got a slim majority over here. Why would I get rid of him? You would not have needed you would not have needed this second impeachment vote uh, in order to make it happen. That would have happened on the first pass if George Santos was still in Congress. Without a doubt, he would have been. And he's, I talk to George Santos all the time. He was a solid yes vote for the conservative cause, and we had him. And now, what did we do? We gave it back to the Democrats with the election last night. I don't know. Sometimes I'm just thinking I don't understand what Republicans are always what they're thinking, but sometimes we make some foolish foolish decisions and the democrats just love it they they watch us just erode i mean we have the gavel up here the american people gave us the gavel they're begging for leadership but that doesn't necessarily mean we're in the majority uh, congressman troy Nels, i have to ask you about uh, the developments today in the congress apparently the house intel committee chairman mike turner sends out a memo to all members of congress says you've got to get over here you've got to see this really important intelligence about this urgent threat to the United States, the White House is out saying that, uh, taking credit for that, they're like, actually, it was our idea to tell everybody about this urgent threat. In fact, we're briefing Congress about this uh, tomorrow. What What is all of this about, in your view? Well, what this is about is they want to bring FISA, the Foreign Surveillance and, and Intelligence Act. They want to bring FISA back. we got to reauthorize FISA. And so you got Turner. He's the, he's the head. He's the chair over in t- Intel. And then we have, you know, a, a, a judiciary kind of oversees a lot of this. And we have concerns about the way the FBI has abused FISA. They did it to Carter Page. They spied on Carter Page, an American citizen, a Naval Academy a graduate, right? Just an American hero. But what is Carter Page? What was his problem? Well, he was working with the Trump campaign. He was affiliated with the Trump campaign back in 2016. So they used FISA. Uh, to surveil him, and FISA was never intended was never intended to spy on American citizens. It was set aside to spy on foreigners on foreign soil, foreigners on foreign soil, not even foreigners here. So they've abused their authority. They've done it on several times, and I've told Chairman Jordan and others, if you think for one minute I'm going to reauthorize FISA for the FBI, forget it. It's not happening. So we've got some conflict over here, whether it's requires a warrant, doesn't require a warrant, and some other things, and we can't get the Republicans to come together on this. So Speaker Johnson now has said, we're not going to be voting on FISA on Friday. Everybody go home tomorrow night because it's just, we're going to, I'll say kick the can down the road, but it will come up so, at a later date. So so the Speaker, you're right, I, I saw the news that he has uh, not, is not going to hold that vote this week. He was expected to, it, it needs to be considered before April, and that's when the expiration occurs uh, but is it your view that he's kicking the can for a moment on this vote just because he doesn't want it to lose on the House floor? It's just a tactical decision, or is he on your side of this debate that it requires a warrant? Well, I don't know. I think I think Mike Johnson is a pretty conservative guy, but he's got Mike Turner and others, and, and he's got a divided House, or even a divided conference, per se. You can see that we've got, we can't even agree on on uh, whether we impeach my orcas or not, we got Republicans that don't agree. So he, he's got a tough deal with only a few uh, uh, members in the majority here. So he's got to make sure that if he's going to start bringing things to the floor, that he has the numbers, he has the votes to win. Because yes. last week when we brought up my orcas and we brought up Israel and stuff under suspension, he lost them both. And it makes us look like we're not very, very well organized or, or we're not together. Uh, and I don't think he wants that. I, I got to say, you know, these last two weeks, maybe in particular, I don't know if you're feeling it inside of Congress, but from outside, it does seem like the fights are becoming more meaningful and in some ways more productive. The fact that uh, that that Speaker Johnson announced that that ridiculous amnesty package was dead on arrival 
when it arrives at the House. And then subsequently, this massive foreign aid package without any border security whatsoever, also dead on arrival. It seems like a good something good is happening, but it's taking a lot of actual fighting to achieve it. It will. And if you look at both those, those are initiated. Those are started out in the Senate side. Uh, this aid package, I mean, come on. I don't we're going to give sixty billion more to Ukraine. We're going to give. I, I support Iran, uh, Israel funding, but that's not going to be a standalone bill. They want to give some to Guam, some to Taiwan, and the reason they're trying to p- combine all these is it it will capture more Republicans. So it's just, it's just a strategy on the Senate side to say, hey, listen, we know there are members in the Republican conference over there that wants to support Ukraine funding. They want to support Taiwan. So let's put it all together. And there's certainly Republicans that want to support funding for Israel. So let's try to capture them, so to speak, by, by putting all these different countries under the same supplemental you know, aid bill. But I, I, I am a dead no. I, I've never given Ukraine a nickel from the beginning, and I'm not about to do it today. I believe these bills should be standalone bills. Funding for Ukraine, vote on it. Funding for Israel, vote on it. But to combine all this garbage together, I just can't support it. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm cheering you on on the uh, FISA fight. Please get rid of all of this illegal surveillance of the American people. And while you're at it, get rid of TSA at the airport, too. Would you mind? Buddy, that's a whole— <laughs> Don't get me started on TSA, brother. And all. I tell you, these unions are too damn strong up here. They have way, way too much influence. Uh, it's just so it's just so stupid, the whole thing. It's like ridiculous. All right, Congressman Troy Nels, thank you uh, very much. Really appreciate your time today, as always. Today, a number of Democrats getting together to announce that they're launching a hip-hop task force <laughs> to tackle what they say is racial inequity. They announced that in the Hill today. Uh, here they are. Here's Jamal Bowman the man who pulls fire alarms to disrupt the lawful proceedings of Congress. Here he is announcing the Hip Hop Task Force. Hip Hop is not just music. It's not just an art form. It's a culture with a multi-billion dollar economy, but we haven't harnessed the power of it yet to make transformative change in legislation. Oh, you see, he said, you know, hip hop is not just an art form. It's a multi-billion dollar industry. We haven't harnessed its power yet to change everything legislatively in America. Get ready for get ready for the rap song telling us why we should vote for Joe Biden. <laughs> That's really looking forward to that. You know. So Jamal Bowman and company announcing that today. Uh, also news today in uh, in the lives of of other Democrats, Hillary Clinton's longtime aide and rumored girlfriend Huma Abedin, 47 years old, reveals she is dating George Soros's billionaire playboy son Alex. 38. They're thick as thieves, these people. Why is it it's all the same characters all the time? Just, you know, running around to one another, flying off to various islands on the same planes and the same problems that we get out of all of this. Uh, Huma Abedin is apparently dating George Soros' son, Alex. Uh, She is nine years his senior as the pair take their romance public during a Valentine's Day date in Paris. They're living a great life. They're having a great time. The rest of us, not so much. Disgraced politician Anthony Weiner's ex-wife, Huma Abedin, the Daily Mail reports, has seemingly revealed she is dating billionaire George Soros' son, Alex, who is almost 10 years her junior. The longtime aide to Hillary Clinton appeared to take her romance public Wednesday. She shared a photo of herself and Alex enjoying a Valentine's Day date at a restaurant in Paris. In the image, which was posted on Instagram stories by both Huma and Alex, shows the pair cuddling up in a corner booth behind a table strewn with red roses and gifts with the billionaire playboy adding, Happy Valentine's Day, in a message above their heads. Oh, how sweet. So they get to live a luxurious life. They're in Paris having a wonderful Valentine's Day. Meanwhile, there's a barricaded situation going on in southeast D.C. right now. A gunman opening fire on cops. It continues at this hour. That started this morning. Everybody else is living in chaos, led by the likes of the Soros family. But the Soros kid, he gets to have a romantic Romantic meal with Huma Abedin, Hillary Clinton's alleged ex-girlfriend. I said alleged. The great one, Mark Levin, up next here on WML.